This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chekris, London, UK. The Idle Thoughts of an Idle Fellow by Jerome K. Jerome. Section 1 on being idle. Now, this is a subject on which I flatter myself I really am au fait. The gentleman who, when I was young, bathed me at Wisdom's font for nine guineas a term, no extras, used to say he never knew a boy who could do less work in more time. And I remember my poor grandmother once incidentally observing in the course of an instruction upon the use of the prayer book that it was highly improbable that I should ever do much that I ought not to do, but that she felt convinced beyond a doubt that I should leave undone pretty well everything that I ought to do. I am afraid I have somewhat belied half the dear old lady's prophecy. Heaven help me. I have done a good many things that I ought not to have done in spite of my laziness. But I have fully confirmed the accuracy of her judgment so far as neglecting much that I ought not to have neglected is concerned. Idling always has been my strong point. I take no credit to myself in the matter. It is a gift. Few possess it. There are plenty of lazy people and plenty of slow coaches, but a genuine idler is a rarity. He is not a man who slouches about with his hands in his pockets. On the contrary, his most startling characteristic is that he is always intensely busy. It is impossible to enjoy idling thoroughly unless one has plenty of work to do. There is no fun in doing nothing when you have nothing to do. Wasting time is merely an occupation, then, and a most exhausting one. Idleness, like kisses, to be sweet must be stolen. Many years ago, when I was a young man, I was taken very ill. I never could see myself that much was the matter with me, except that I had a beastly cold. But I suppose it was something very serious, for the doctor said that I ought to have come to him a month before, and that if it, whatever it was, had gone on for another week, he would not have answered for the consequences. It is an extraordinary thing, but I never knew a doctor called into any case yet but what it transpired that another day's delay would have rendered cure hopeless. Our medical guide philosopher and friend is like the hero in a melodrama. He always comes upon the scene just and only just in the nick of time. It is providence, that is what it is. Well, as I was saying, I was very ill and was ordered to Buxton for a month with strict injunctions to do nothing whatever all the while that I was there. Rest is what you require, said the doctor. Perfect rest. It seemed a delightful prospect. This man evidently understands my complaint, said I, and I pictured to myself a glorious time, a four weeks dolce far niente, with a dash of illness in it. Not too much illness, but just illness enough, just sufficient to give it the flavour of suffering and make it poetical. I should get up late, sip chocolate, and have my breakfast in slippers and a dressing gown. I should lie out in the garden in a hammock, and read sentimental novels with a melancholy ending, until the books should fall from my listless hand, and I should recline there, dreamily gazing into the deep blue of the firmament, watching the fleecy clouds floating like white-sailed ships across its depths and listening to the joyous song of the birds, and the low rustling of the trees. Or, on becoming too weak to go out of doors, 
I should sit propped up with pillows at the open window of the ground-floor front, and look wasted and interesting, so that all the pretty girls would sigh as they pass by. And twice a day I should go down in a bath-chair to the colonnade to drink the waters. Oh, those waters! I knew nothing about them then, and was rather taken with the idea. Drinking the waters sounded fashionable and Queen Anne-fied, and I thought I should like them. But, oh, after the first three or four mornings, Sam Weller's description of them as having a taste of warm flat irons conveys only a faint idea of their hideous nauseousness. If anything could make a sick man get well quickly, it would be the knowledge that he must drink a glassful of them every day until he was recovered. I drank them neat for six consecutive days, and they nearly killed me. But after then I adopted the plan of taking a stiff glass of brandy and water immediately on the top of them, and found much relief thereby. I have been informed since by various eminent medical gentlemen that the alcohol must have entirely counteracted the effects of the calibiate properties contained in the water. I am glad I was lucky enough to hit upon the right thing. But drinking the waters was only a small portion of the torture I experienced during that memorable month, a month which was, without exception, the most miserable I have ever spent. During the best part of it I religiously followed the doctor's mandate and did nothing whatever, except moon about the house and garden, and go out for two hours a day in a bath-chair. That did break the monotony to a certain extent. There is more excitement about bath-chairing, especially if you are not used to the exhilarating exercise, than might appear to the casual observer. A sense of danger, such as a mere outsider might not understand, is ever present to the mind of the occupant. He feels convinced every minute that the whole concern is going over, a conviction which becomes especially lively whenever a ditch or a stretch of newly macadamized road comes in sight. Every vehicle that passes he expects is going to run into him, and he never finds himself ascending or descending a hill without immediately beginning to speculate upon his chances, supposing, as seems extremely probable, that the weak-kneed controller of his destiny should let go. But even this diversion failed to enliven after a while, and the ennui became perfectly unbearable. I felt my mind giving way under it. It is not a strong mind, and I thought it would be unwise to tax it too far. So, somewhere about the twentieth morning, I got up early, had a good breakfast, and walked straight off to Hayfield, at the foot of the Kinder Scout, a pleasant, busy little town, reached through a lovely valley, and with two sweetly pretty women in it. At least they were sweetly pretty then. One passed me on the bridge, and, I think, smiled, and the other was standing at an open door, making an unremunerative investment of kisses upon a red-faced baby. But it is years ago, and I dare say they have both grown stout and snappish since that time. Coming back, I saw an old man breaking stones, and it roused such strong longing in me to use my arms that I offered him a drink to let me take his place. He was a kindly old man, and he humoured me. I went for those stones with the accumulated energy of three weeks— and did more work in half an hour than he had done all day. But it did not make him jealous. Having taken the plunge, I went further and further into dissipation, going out for a long walk every morning, and listening to the band in the pavilion every evening. But the days still passed slowly, notwithstanding, and I was heartily glad when the last one came, 
and I was being whirled away from gouty, consumptive Buxton to London with its stern work and life. I looked out of the carriage as we rushed through Hendon in the evening. The lurid glare overhanging the mighty city seemed to warm my heart, and when, later on, my cab rattled out of St. Pancras station, the old familiar roar that came swelling up around me sounded the sweetest music I had heard for many a long day. I certainly did not enjoy that month's idling. I like idling when I ought not to be idling, not when it's the only thing I have to do. That is my pig-headed nature. The time when I like best to stand with my back to the fire, calculating how much I owe, is when my desk is heaped highest with letters that must be answered by the next post. When I like to dawdle longest over my dinner is when I have a heavy evening's work before me. And if, for some urgent reason, I ought to be up particularly early in the morning, it is then, more than at any other time, that I love to lie an extra half-hour in bed. Ah, how delicious it is to turn over and go to sleep again, just for five minutes. Is there any human being, I wonder, besides the hero of a Sunday school tale for boys, who ever gets up willingly? There are some men to whom getting up at the proper time is an utter impossibility. If eight o'clock happens to be the time that they should turn out, then they lie till half-past. If circumstances change, and half-past eight becomes early enough for them, then it is nine before they can rise. They are like the statesman of whom it was said that he was always punctually half an hour late. They try all manner of schemes. They buy alarm clocks, artful contrivances that go off at the wrong time and alarm the wrong people. They tell Sarah Jane to knock at the door and call them, and Sarah Jane does knock at the door and does call them, and they grunt back, All right, and then go comfortably to sleep again. I knew one man who would actually get out and have a cold bath, and even that was of no use, for afterward he would jump into bed again to warm himself. I think myself that I could keep out of bed all right if I once got out. It is the wrenching away of the head from the pillow that I find so hard, and no amount of overnight determination makes it easier. I say to myself, after having wasted the whole evening, Well, I won't do any more work tonight. I'll get up early tomorrow morning, and I'm thoroughly resolved to do so. Then... In the morning, however, I feel less enthusiastic about the idea, and reflect that it would have been much better if I had stopped up last night. And then there is the trouble of dressing, and the more one thinks about that, the more one wants to put it off. It is a strange thing, this bed, this mimic grave, where we stretch our tired limbs and sink away so quietly into the silence and rest. O oh bed, O oh bed, delicious bed, that heaven on earth to the weary head, as sang poor Hood. You were a kind old nurse to us fretful boys and girls. Clever and foolish, naughty and good, you take us all in your motherly lap and hush our wayward crying. The strong man full of care, the sick man full of pain, the little maiden sobbing for her faithless lover, like children we lay our aching heads on your white bosom, and you gently soothe us off to bye-bye. Our trouble is sore indeed, when you turn away and will not comfort us. How long the dawn seems coming when we cannot sleep! Oh, those hideous nights when we toss and turn in fever and pain! When we lie like living men among the dead! "'staring out into the dark hours "'that drift so slowly between us and the light. "'And, oh, 
those still more hideous nights when we sit by another in pain, when the low fire startles us every now and then with a falling cinder, and the tick of the clock seems a hammer beating out the life that we are watching. But enough of beds and bedrooms. I've kept to them too long, even for an idle fellow. Let us come out and have a smoke. That wastes time just as well and does not look so bad. Tobacco has been a blessing to us idlers. What the civil service clerk before Sir Walter's time found to occupy their minds with, it is hard to imagine. I attribute the quarrelsome nature of the Middle Ages, young men, entirely to the want of the soothing weed. They had no work to do, and could not smoke, and the consequence was that they were forever fighting and rowing. If by any extraordinary chance there was no war going, then they got up a deadly family feud with the next-door neighbour, and if, in spite of this, they still had a few spare moments on their hands, they occupied them with discussions as to whose sweetheart was the best-looking, the arguments employed on both sides being battle-axes, clubs, etc. Questions of taste were soon decided in those days. When a twelfth-century youth fell in love, he did not take three paces backward, gaze into her eyes and tell her she was too beautiful to live. He said he would step outside and see about it. And if, when he got out, he met a man and broke his head, uh, the other man's head, I mean, then that proved that his, uh, the first fellow's, girl, was a pretty girl. But if the other fellow broke his head, uh, not his own, you know, but the other fellow's, the other fellow to the second fellow, that is, because, of course, the other fellow would only be the other fellow to him, not the first fellow who, well, if, if he broke his head, then his girl, not the other fellow's, but the fellow who was... Uh, Look here. If A broke B's head, then A's girl was a pretty girl. But if B broke A's head, then A's girl wasn't a pretty girl, but B's girl was. That was their method of conducting art criticism. Nowadays, we light a pipe and let the girls fight it out among themselves. They do it very well. They are getting to do all our work. They are doctors, and barristers, and artists. They manage theatres, and promote swindles, and edit newspapers. I am looking forward to the time when we men shall have nothing to do but lie in bed till twelve, read two novels a day, have nice little five o'clock teas all to ourselves, and tax our brains with nothing more trying than discussions upon the latest patterns in trousers, and arguments as to what Mr. Jones's coat was made of, and whether it fitted him. It is a glorious prospect for idle fellows. End of section one.